Hello class, Dr. Newell here. It is National Poetry Month. I am so excited about that for this read aloud. I found the perfect book for us. It is entitled, Can I Touch Your Hair? Poems of Race, Mistakes, and Friendship. It's a really great book. It has 42 pages and I am not gonna read them all, but I will read a couple of the poems for you. I thought it was really important to choose this book because though we've talked about poetry in class, we haven't really gotten into it too deeply or deep enough where we've seen poetry other than poems that had rhyming sentences or rhyming endings of the sentences. So I wanted to introduce this book to you guys. Can I touch your hair? You saw the cover. Now we're looking at the inside of the book, just the inside cover, where it has the table of contents so it can help you find your um, poems better on which page they're listed on. And it also has two quotes and a picture at the bottom. I want you to think about the cover that we saw. I want you to think about the two quotes and I'll read them. Salvation for a race, nation or class must come from within. The only thing that will redeem mankind is cooperation. You also see the picture below that looks like a teacher talking to her class. I want you to think about what type of poems you're gonna read. What will the context of those poems be? After we're done reading a couple of the poems, I'm going to post some questions along with it with the link to Flipgrid so that you guys can go in and make your video in response to the reading and the questions asked. You also have an opportunity to log into Class Dojo and drop your video there if you have a student account or to write in your answer in the thread for this read aloud for this week, all right? Let's get started. The Poem Project. When our teacher says, pick a partner, my body freezes like a ship in ice. I want Patty Jean, but Madison has already looped arms with her. Within seconds, you never know what he's going to say. Charles is the only one left. How many poems? Someone asks. About what? Do they have to be true? Mrs. Vandenberg holds up her hand. Write about anything. It's not black and white, but it is. Charles is black and I'm white. Writing partner. Mrs. Vandenberg wants us to write poems. <laughs> Finally, an easy project. Words fly off my pen onto the paper like writing is my superpower. The rest of the time, my words are a curse. I open my mouth and people run away. Now I'm stuck with Irene. She hardly says anything. Plus she's white. Her stringy dishwater blonde hair waves back and forth as she stutter steps toward me. My stomach bottoms out. Hello, I say. Hi, she says. I surprise myself by smiling at her. She smells like a mix of perfume and soap. We stare at our sneakers before I ask, so what do you want to write about? She shrugs. I say, how about our shoes? Hair? Then we can write about school and church. She takes a deep breath. <sighs> okay, I match it. Let's start there. Shoes. I want my ruby shoes with heels to click me to another land or glass slippers to make a dancer out of me. But mama says shoes should be sensible, plain white or solid black to go with everything. So that's what we buy. When I show Patty Jean, she gives me her rainbow socks and a pair of purple shoelaces. When I look down, I can't believe those feet belong to me. Shopping with dad. Dad doesn't think shoes have anything to do with fashion. Shoes are like your complexion, he says. 
They're supposed to fit you perfectly. I'd rather get another pair of neon high tops with tie-dye laces like I've seen on commercials. Maybe they make my feet hurt sometimes, and maybe they don't last as long, but at least I fit in with my classmates. Dad hands me a pair of low tops. No cool design, no bright color or dynamite laces. I tie them up, walk around. Wow, I say. This pair feels like I'm wearing slippers. Dad tells me, the decision is yours. Hair. Now, my hair is long and straight, a curtain I can hide behind. But once when I was little, I begged for an afro. So mama cut my hair short as a boy's and gave me a perm. I fluffed it with a pick big as it would go until my brothers laughed, called me a circus clown without the red nose. Strands. On a random Tuesday on the bus, Dennis asks me, can I touch your hair? He pats it before I can respond. It feels like a sponge, he says. My fists clench and my face gets hot. You need to learn to wait for an answer after asking permission, I tell him and pat his hair hard. Oh, how about that? Your hair feels like a mop, I say. I keep my fists ready, but he turns away. Church. At church, we light candles and pray for those who are sick. At church, we sit, stand, kneel. We give thanks for food and warmth and family. At church, the sun streams through our stained glass Jesus, his arms thrown wide to welcome everyone. At church, everyone is white. Sunday service. Our Sunday service is like hitting a reset button, starting off the week with a new beginning. There's men dressed in suits so sharp you could cut yourself by looking at them. There's women testifying in wide-brimmed, bow-tied hats called crowns. Everyone's brown arms are raised in devotion, except mine. It says in the Bible that Jesus had hair like wool, eyes that were a flame of fire, and feet like brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Then why is everyone praising the straight-haired, blue-eyed white man I see looking down over all of us? Beach Day. There's a pack of guys and girls whose pearly skins have been baked into a bronzed hue strolling past me. Each of them has hair woven into cornrows or twisted into dreadlocks. Some of their lips jut out like puffer fish. When I wave, they look at each other, begin snorting, laughing at my good manners. I feel a fury rising inside me as if I'm a tidal wave about to crash on land. I'm confused. Why do people who want to look like me hate me so much? Beach. While the older girls shine themselves with cooking oil to get the perfect flapjack tan, mama makes a ghost of me. She slathers on sunscreen so thick, I turn stiff and sticky and my eyes sting. When mama's not looking, I scrub it all off with a towel. I'd rather be sunburned than sugar sand white. The athlete. In gym class, when captains select teammates for a game of basketball, I get picked first, maybe for being lanky or for having darker skin. I guess it seems like a good idea to them until I take a shot that goes over the backboard. I get picked last for basketball after that. During reading time, when Mrs. Vandenberg says we each have to read a chapter of The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963, everyone groans when it's my turn until the words gush out of my mouth, smooth and fast like the River Jordan. By the time I'm done, smiles spread across each classmate's face. I now get selected to read first every time. Horseback riding. 
I don't know how to explain to Charles how I feel about horses when he shuffles so fast from one subject to the next. Finally, I blurt, sometimes I just need a break from people. He surprises me and shuts up right away. So I tell him about the sweet scent of hay and saddle soap, how my stomach somersaults when honey surges from trot to canter, and how the wind parts my hair when I lean into her neck whispering faster, faster. When I want honey to slow down, all I have to do is give the reins a gentle tug and soon we are back to clop clopping. Honey and I understand each other without any words at all. Playground. After lunch, I skip past the swings and basketball court to the spot by the fence where the black girls play freeze dance. I watch for a few minutes, hoping Shonda will invite me to join them instead of me having to ask, can I play? I smile when Shonda comes over, but she doesn't smile back. You've got the whole rest of the playground, she says. Can't we at least have this corner? Fresh start. Some kids huddle together by the swings, gabbing about the football game when I spot J.R. and Nicholas. They're the only two friends who came by last summer when I invited everyone to swim in our pool. When I walk over, J.R. says, come on, man, stay away from us. Nicholas breaks in. Your mouth is like a race car that never stops to refuel. The group shakes with laughter. I can't believe my friends would play me dirty like that. My body crumples before I mope over to Irene, who's watching some girls play freeze dance. I plop down next to her. Want to work on our project? Ghost. There's a new student at school who I haven't met yet. He goes by the name Ghost. At least that's what his new friends, all the same color, call him. I introduce myself. Hey, Ghost, my name's Charles. His pasty skin heats up faster than a summer's day. My name's Paul, he says leaving my outstretched hand to dangle. I realize I'm a few shades too dark to be allowed to call him by his nickname. Geography. When Mrs. Vandenberg points to the US map and asks, why do we call this region the Black Belt? I stretch my hand high, but she calls on Patty Jean instead. Patty Jean leans forward like she's sure she's right because black people live there. Mrs. Vandenberg's face squinches like a rotten peach and her voice comes out sour. Of course not, Patty Jean, use your head. I sink down into my seat. Patty Jean's answer is my answer. I learn when it comes to black and white, sometimes it's best to press my lips closed and not say anything at all. Dinner conversation. Grandma and grandpa are visiting, so our dining room table is filled with soul food, crispy fried chicken coated in seasoning, gooey, creamy baked macaroni and cheese, collard greens mixed with chunks of ham hock, red velvet cake smeared in cream cheese icing. But I can't eat any of this. A few weeks ago, I became a vegan, which means no meat or dairy foods for me. Mom brings out my plate filled with beans, rice, and pumpkin. I sprinkle Himalayan sea salt and chili, paper on, chili pepper on top. I don't understand this, Dad says. Soul food is our history. I clamp my teeth down to hold back everything I want to say about how soul food leads to cancer and diabetes. How unfair that trillions of animals get killed every year for food and clothing. Instead, I swallow hard and say nothing. Everybody gazes at the food, silent. Dad shakes his head. Grandma turns away from the family, smiles, then gives me a wink as we begin to say grace. Best and worst. Each night we go around the supper table, say the best part of our day and the worst. 
Bests are easy as creamed potatoes and A on my math test, pajama day, new shoes, worsts stick in my throat like tiny fish bones. The bracelet I lost and still can't find. My sniffly nose, what Shonda said at recess. But saying it out loud helps. We listen and laugh. After supper, we all play a trivia game. And once I even win. Forgiveness. I start walking home from school. When I hear my name called, I turn around. It's him. Yes, him. The one who once asked me, why do you always try to act like one of us? All because I earned my A plus report card, pushing through homework instead of playing video games, not saying you ain't or you is or I'm doing good. Hey, man, he says, I'm sorry for what I said to you a while back. I freeze in shock before matching his extended hand with my own. Wow, thanks, man. I say, that means a lot. I'm curious, though. What made you apologize to me? Well, he says, last week a couple of African Americans asked me the same question I asked you. Apology. When Shonda presents her family tree to the class, I see all all the top branches are draped in chains because my ancestors were slaves, she says. I swallow. I want to say, I'm sorry, but those words are so small for something so big. So still, I want to try. So I write it on a scrap of paper, find her library book, and tuck it inside. All right, class, I'm going to stop reading here. There are several more pages and several more, more poems for you to read. I will attach some questions for reflection and collaboration in our um, class dojo. All right, so enjoy the rest of the book. You can log right into Epic and you can finish reading from page 24. We've already read through pages 23. Have a great one.